Hello, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with RealityShifters.com talking with you today about discernment and balancing between sensitivity and specificity. The idea here is the importance at these times or any times really when it seems like there's a lot going on and you don't know quite who or what to trust and you want to be able to get clear, stay calm, stay focused and go with your highest guidance. How do we access that in these challenging times? And one thing I've been looking at closely lately is this notion that it's possible to be very, very sensitive, but it requires a lot of us. It requires that we become the best listeners possible. How do we do that? I would recommend by practicing clearing the mind. And so sensitivity comes from you might wonder, what is that? I see it a lot when I look at naturalists who are biologists out in the field, not necessarily knowing what they're about to see. And those are some of my favorite scientists when I was a little girl. I love to read stories about scientists who would just go out and observe things, not knowing necessarily what they might find, and paying attention to everything rather than assuming that things would fit into neat neatly organized categories or anything like that. Now obviously in science we get pretty specific and things become like in the field of biology we've got kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So if you want to identify a plant now you've got these fun little apps on your phone or your iPad and you can take a photograph of a plant or animal and get it identified rather quickly. But um, originally before there were such categories, there is a need for people to actually be in the field paying attention. In the field of medicine, and this is how the idea came to me to do this video today and to write about this, I was reading the blog written by a wonderful doctor. Um, the blog is on Substack and it's a Midwestern doctor from the forgotten side of medicine. And one of the things that this particular blog entry was talking about is sensitivity and specificity and how it's taught in the field of medicine. I'm just going to read you a little bit from this blog because I thought it was so interesting. So here's the, the post. Within medicine, many medical decisions are made based on sensitivity and specificity, although they are rarely described in this terminology. For example, the reason why a doctor checks your cholesterol and your blood pressure is because if either of those is too high, it may increase your risk of dying over time. However, the risk dramatically varies as different human beings have different ideal cholesterol and blood pressure levels. For example, in older adults, their arteries tend to calcify and thus require more pressure to, more, to move blood through their system. For these patients, Higher blood pressure is thus a necessary physiologic compensation of the body. And commonly, when their blood pressure is lowered, with medications to bring it into the quote-unquote ideal range, the reduced blood flow to the brain will cause those patients to pass out and seriously injure themselves. This is a very common pharmaceutical injury in the elderly. So that's just an example from medical thinking as to how do these ideas come into play. Um, and this blogger continues and explores how and where to choose. How do you maximize the sensitivity or the specificity? Like, Because obviously when we're out in the field as an original first person on, on the scene to experience a new species of animal or plant, we want to be pretty wide open. We want to be have the sensitivity setting so it's wide open and we're able to pick up pretty much anything that falls into those categories or those ranges for us. Okay, the, the blogger continues, in modern medicine, there has been a consistent bias to continually lower the cutoff points for sensitivity and specificity. And over the years, using blood pressure as an example, the acceptable threshold has been repeatedly lowered. As a result, many individuals who are told they absolutely must take blood pressure medicines or have an immediate risk of dying 50 years ago would not even have been considered candidates for blood pressure medications. Now that's interesting 
because that's showing us that things haven't changed necessarily, but the way we are applying our guidelines has changed. How specific, how sensitive are we expecting the readings to be? And the, and the blogger continues, as you might have guessed, this bias is a result of pharmaceutical corruption within medicine because as thresholds are lowered, this makes more individuals eligible for drugs and thereby causes more and more to be sold. One of the best examples is statins being recommended for everyone to lower healthy cholesterol levels on the basis of non-existent evidence voted through by committees composed of scientists taking money from statin companies. The continually increasing sensitivity for requiring quote-unquote preventative medicines leads to the curious tradition we have now where the majority of the population is on multiple medications, many of which do not benefit the patients and in combination significantly increase the likelihood of death or disability for the patient. So here we go. How does this apply to us? Quantum jumpers, reality shifters, all of that good stuff. Well, how it applies to us is discernment. Back to that core question that I started today's video with, looking at the idea, how do we discern? And how do we set our own sensitivity and our specificity levels? You may not think you have any, um, but we do. We're born with them. We've, we come in with firmware. Newborn babies are able to instantly recognize faces, the smiles and the eyes, even before they know anything. They know what a face is somehow. That's interesting. So we have some built-in bias, because that's a kind of bias when you're looking for something. It's an expectation bias. Um, so when we're discerning properly, what we'd like to do, in my opinion, is start becoming a lot more transcendent, recognizing that there are levels of our consciousness, um, not just within our three major neuron centers, which would be the gut, the heart, and the head, but also you could think of having perhaps higher levels of intuition that would be spiritual knowingness, that intuitive knowingness that sometimes we get where we know something that there's no way we could know it, and we're sensing something more deeply. And I pretty much, when I do my consulting and coaching, I depend on that. I'm going to read a quote to you now by John Muir. Now, he's a famous naturalist. He did a lot of exploration in California. And um, we've got the John Muir Trail, and he had a big role to play in preserving a lot of our natural areas. And the, the quote I'm going to read is a short one. But it says, most people are on the world, not in it have no conscious sympathy or relationship to anything about them, undiffused, separate, and rigidly alone, like marbles of polished stone, touching but separate. So if we look at that, then we can see that mankind has become a master of specificity, that we've somehow become very interested in the things that we can measure, that we can weigh, that we can absolutely agree upon. But in our quest for certainty, we've risked losing our ability to trust our own hearts, trust our own souls, trust our own spirit. And so when we take a look at all of that and the role that this two-step process can play, that one where we first clear our minds, this is what I do when I want to tune in and really get good intuition. First, it really depends that you've been doing a lot of regular practice of clearing your mind. So it's a meditation. One way to do it is like cloud busting. So anytime you think something or a thought comes to mind that's a distraction or a feeling, then you just recognize for right now, I'm just going to clear it. That's a cloud in the sky. I'm just going to go back to clear blue sky right now. So that's the first step. And that's your sensitivity setting. So you're becoming more sensitive to pick things up that could be that still soft, small voice within might be a vision, a knowingness, all kinds of things. And number two, my kind of specificity when I'm tuning in intuition is tuning in my high self. So I know I've got my gut wisdom from my, the neurons and the diaphragm down the root level diaphragm down at my gut level. I know I've got heart knowingness and I know I've got head knowingness. So if I want to get the view from above, then I can go to an imaginary level, but it feels quite real to me. It's an imaginal realm, meaning quite real, where I know 
that there's a part of me that already knows the answer. There's a part of me that's above the current problem at hand. There's a part of me that can connect with the best possible reality, all of the possible realities, in fact, and everyone and everything else of any importance in this matter. So whatever it might be, the specificity that I receive will be exactly what I need right now to make the best possible choices, plans, and solve problems too. Really getting a great view of the situation from that higher level point of view. And this is also involved in the way we facilitate our memories. The more you do this, the more you'll be able to recognize you are that level of knowingness rather than just channeling it. So it might start like you're feeling like I'm getting this wisdom from somewhere and I'm hearing something. The more you do it, the more you start might you start recognizing this is me. My high self, my best possible future self. That's me. And this can start happening when you ask questions like my favorite question, which is how good can it get? Because if you're applying it to yourself, then how good can it get becomes how good can I get? How much can I be? my best self, my high self, my spiritual self. So until next time, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with realityshifters.com, of course inviting you to keep asking, how good can it get? Take care.